Hi everyone, we're here in Taipei with William Belbin at the Mox office, and let's start by letting uh, William introduce himself a bit. Hi, my name is William Balbean. I'm a partner at SOSV. Um, been doing tech investment for about 25 years now, uh, and uh, started off in equity research. Uh, worked in uh, Asia, then the U.S., then back to Asia the last five years with Deutsche Bank, where I worked on IPOs for companies like Alibaba and Kingsoft, where the head of engineering was Lei Jun, who started Xiaomi. Um, more recently, though. Um, basically moved to venture capital in 07, which was a very good time uh, in Asia. Things were really just rocketing uh, and ran China for SoftBank. Uh, and then we didn't do a second fund there, so started uh, Singto Innovate with two other uh, co you know, managing directors. Uh, and the last six years at SOSV, and SOSV is a bit different than most VCs in that we all invest globally. Um, we invest uh, by vertical, so we have hardware, biotech, and internet and software, which I run with my partner, Oscar, all in one fund. Uh, and we invest early stage in the way we help our companies that we invest in. 150 companies a year, internet and software, 40 companies a year, is through our five accelerators. Uh, so China Accelerator for Enterprise and Mox for Consumer. Uh, so it's uh, been a lot of fun. Uh, the last six and a half years have been a whirlwind. And thanks for having me today. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, can you explain a bit how people can get interested in the accelerator, how they can apply, and how long the program usually lasts? Okay, so uh, application is easy. Um, you can apply online on our websites, ChinaAccelerator.com and MoxMobileOnlyX.com. But the best way is to get a referral. Um, we have over 450 mentors. Uh, and just get in touch with somebody you know. I mean, it's a pretty big network. And get a referral in through uh, a mentor is uh, generally preferable. We're also partnered with 120 other accelerators that feed deals to us. Um, we're a bit different than most accelerators in that we're, you could say, the late stage of the early stage. So we work with companies that already have product market fit. So they have a product, they have customers, and they're making at least a little bit of revenue, usually at least 5, 10K monthly net revenue. Uh, on average now, the companies that we take are t doing about 35K US monthly net revenue. And what we do is help companies, startups from all around the world, and especially in Asia, grow in Asia. So if you think other you know, accelerators, they focus on the US, we're focused on Asia. China, India, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, helping the companies grow up in their home market, and then going cross-border across Asia. So that's what we help with. Interesting. And how and why are you have, have this office here in Taiwan? Do you have a lot of companies that you have based here, or what's the story with Taiwan? So um, I've been coming to Taiwan and living in Taiwan since 1993. Um, it's an amazing place. Um, but the economy here uh, is actually not very good. Um, in fact, uh, Taiwan is a technology center, uh, but it's technology and hardware, and they never really made the transition to internet. So um, the, the wages here haven't changed in 20 years, um, but there's a huge amount of talent, extremely educated. And so we came here because of that talent. Um, there is a real shortage in tech talent, programmers, developers across Asia. Um, so five years ago, I decided I could put Mox anywhere, and I decided to put Mox in Taiwan because of the talent. Um, we're investing across Asia, you know, China, Southeast Asia, India. There's a dearth of talent. You know, it's very hard to find um, very good engineers like across Southeast Asia, but Taiwan has an excess of them. Uh, and so what we generally do, we, we invested in, in about four or five Taiwan companies, and I've been investing in internet companies in Taiwan since 2007. Uh, but most of our companies in Taiwan are companies that we bring from outside to Taiwan. Uh, and they build their teams here. The biggest one is SnapAsk. Uh, so SnapAsk, um, you know, they started as a small startup in Hong Kong, but now they have uh, almost 130 people here in their Taiwan team. Their entire tech and uh, product team is here in Taiwan. Interesting. Um, you say you do a lot of, um, like, cross Asia helping companies grow, but do you feel that, you know, Every, every country, every region of Asia is different, especially with, with China. So how do you um, deal with this, with the different countries' languages and barriers? Yeah, so think about 
as an entrepreneur, you're trying to find product market fit. You have a, you know, there's a problem, and then you build a solution to the problem, or you, you have some sort of unique technology that helps. Uh, and um, when you go cross border, it's not that you have to completely reinvent the wheel, but it's almost like every time you go into a new country, you have to get product market fit again. Uh, so, for example, for China, um, the SaaS business model doesn't really work because people generally don't pay on a monthly basis by user. In fact, people generally and historically don't pay for software. So the business model has to be significantly changed. Oftentimes the product needs to be significantly changed when you go country by country by country, market by market by market, and that's what we help with. Interesting. Um, is it also because you've been doing it so long that you already have like your foot in the door and you have like your partners, or is there a lot of opportunity for strategic partnerships once you're entered the accelerator? Are these all also kind of opportunities? Yeah. So uh, enterprise is uh, um, China Accelerator is regional Asia enterprise, and then China market entry, um, and that's actually our unfair advantage as a platform. Um, China Accelerator and also Mox, we partner with large corporates. And because we have a huge uh, footprint, we have like 35 full-time team, um, we have 12 experts in residence, and we have over 450 mentors, uh, we can actually flip the model a little bit. So instead of working with like one corporate or two corporates or five corporates, we're actually working um, with uh, 230 multinational corporations. Uh, and we're closely tied running uh, pilots, uh, paid pilot programs with about 42 of them and 25 Fortune 1000 companies invested in our fund. So think about it. So like for Asia, it's a one-stop shop for enterprise sales. And then we also do SaaS. But again, as I mentioned, the SaaS payment model just has to be changed a little bit. Um, now on the mock side, we're also partnering with many, many, many corporates. Uh, so to think about us as a, like a sales BD platform, and on the consumer side, a user acquisition platform. And with both, we're partnering with corporate. So a lot of VCs invest in startups in order to disrupt industries, in order to change industries. Um, and they've been very, very successful. Big internet is very, very big. What we're investing in is a lot of companies that actually sell to the disrupted. Uh, to, so to some extent, we're investing in companies that are allowing large corporations to fight back. And the thing about these large corporations is they still have a lot of money. We think that there's still a lot of opportunity there. Uh, and then again, we're not focused on like the US or, or Europe, we're focused on Asia. Cool, so um, if someone has a startup and they wanna, uh, what, what areas are you looking for now? Or do you think there's a lack or where are you looking at particularly? So the, the great thing about these, like on the, you know, having all these corporate partners is they tell us on a regular basis what their challenges are. Um, and the thing is, they have challenges. They have many, 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 many challenges. Uh, so um, for us, uh, you know, as, as investors, half the time you're trying to figure out what the next thing is. The other half of the time you're trying to figure out, okay, is this the team to attack that opportunity or to solve that problem? Um, for us, the corporates and the large companies, they're telling us um, their challenges all the time. So um, we don't focus on any one area because they have challenges like across all the different areas. So we're, um, we're actually uh, quite active in health, um, yeah, definitely e-commerce, because everybody needs to sell things. And they need to sell things um, without having big internet companies like basically steal all their customers and, and disaggregate them. Um, we are very heavy in fintech, because uh, that actually makes a lot of money. Uh, and the banks and financial institutions are super scared of companies like Ant Financial. Um, you know, their stated goal is to become the largest financial institution in the world. And if that comes true, what happens to all the banks? They're all dead, right? Um, we're also quite, you know, we're doing health, right? So if you look at Alibaba and Tencent and, and even, uh, you know, Ping An, a large, largest insurance company in the world, they um, have the data, they have the distribution, they have the doctors. Um, they also invest in pharma funds. The problem with big pharma is that they actually don't do drug discovery anymore. They just have teams of people who are really good at you know, recognizing um, the productivity and the uh, capability of small teams and then they acquire them. Uh, well, Tencent and Alibaba are building that same capability, plus they're vertically integrated. So their goal is to actually probably kill big pharma. Um, so we're you know, working with um, some very large pharmaceutical companies 
in the past Sanofi, and then uh, now we're working with a few more because they need to be able to actually uh, move out of their traditional area of strength because they're about to get, again, disaggregated by big internet. Can you name a few of these successful health tech or fintech startups that you've been you've been part of? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, so for Sanofi, they're a very large, um, I think, originally French or European uh, drug company. Um, and one of the challenges that they have is how do you get tier five, six, seven, eight, you know, smaller tier cities, con uh, basically consumers, like uh, uh, patients, to take their meds? Uh, especially for lifestyle diseases. So lifestyle disease is like hypertension or diabetes or high blood pressure. And the challenge there is that um, they're chronic and you have to take your meds basically forever. Um, it's very difficult to, you know, to, to, to change your, your body and your diet. Um, and so the problem is you start taking your meds and then you feel better and you, get, you do get better. So they stop taking their meds. And then when that happens, um, they get a second attack. And the second attack is often uh, really bad, especially compared to the first one. And uh, a lot of times people die. So, I mean, diabetes is nothing to joke around with. Uh, high, high, blood, you know, high blood pressure, hypertension. Um, so, like, how do, you, but how do you encourage these people who are, you know, they, 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 um, they're, verse, they're very fragmented. They're all out. Uh, and they might not be, like, the most tech-savvy people in the world. So that was the challenge, and we found them a couple of solutions for China. But then um, we're also investing globally, right? So a lot of VCs, they just focus on one geography. We're global. We're looking all over the world for the best of the best. And so we found a company in India called Fable, uh, Fable with a PH. Uh, and so they actually had, they built a solution to solve this exact problem, um, but they were in India. Uh, and it was one of the fastest investment decisions I have ever made because when you have a corporate partner telling you that this is a problem and then you find a solution for it, all you need to do is figure out, is this the entrepreneur that can take it to the next level? Um, and, and if you want, I can go deep into it, but basically the bottom line for them is they help um, uh, the, the patients take their drugs and one of the tools that they do is they leverage Asian culture. Uh, so if you are familiar with Asian culture, I'm half Chinese, um, there's a lot of encouragement by family members of other family members to do things. Uh, you can call it nagging, you can call it bothering, you can call it yelling. Um, but, uh, you know, if you don't do your homework, you get yelled at a bit, right? So, um, so what's happened uh, with uh, Fable is not only does the patient get an app telling them what their, 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 their levels are and to reminding them to take the pill, but we also give an app to all the family members. So when the patient, their levels are off or they didn't take their pill, everybody in the entire family knows, and then they bug the crap out of the family member to take their medicine, uh, and it's extremely effective. That's funny. I like it. Yeah. And, um, okay, what about crypto? You were telling me earlier that you're quite active, you've been quite active in crypto the last few years. Yeah, so I um, started investing in crypto in 2015. I mean, I, I come from a finance background, although, you know, equity research for tech is not, you know, trading or derivatives or, or like, um, you know, stuff that requires a lot of math, right? We were, we were covering uh, internet. Um, and so um, we... One of my friends, actually, Mark Vanderkees, um, who's very, very active uh, in the space, but he is a blogger, right? Back in the old days when he had blog, like pre-medium. Uh, and he wrote a blog post. He went to um, Richard Branson's island, um, whose name I cannot remember. Necker Island. Uh, what? Necker Island. Necker Island, yes. Uh, it's very expensive. I can't afford to go there. But yes, he went there for a, like, a crypto you know, fast in 2015 early, and I read his blog post. I'm like, oh, wow, this is kind of interesting. Uh, and so in 2015, I did four crypto investments. Um, so the, the key thing was crypto fintech. So again, we're searching for challenges or opportunities or problems usually. And so, you know, I was trying to solve uh, traditional challenges with crypto. And one of the biggest challenges that people have, um, especially with Asia, is moving money around. So I thought like Bitcoin would be really cool if you can use it for cross-border remittance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that did not work, uh, mostly because the companies we invested in couldn't get licenses and uh, what they were doing was, according to many people, illegal. So that didn't work so well. But the, we had one company, BitMEX, that did do well. And the reason why we invested 
uh, and the reason why we started Mox um, was we wanted to open financial services uh, to low-income, middle-income people from around the world. Mm -hmm. The big change is smartphones. $50, $60, $70 Android smartphones were actually becoming a reality. And so the challenge with these people, you know, in uh, Indonesia or India or, you know, even China, um, is that um, they don't really have bank accounts or they do have bank accounts, but they don't have ability to invest. Right, so Warren Buffett loves the S&P, right? S&P 500 index fund is like, you know, one of the, the outperforms every single hedge fund. You know, returns like uh, he had that bet with these hedge fund people. So what we were trying to do with BitMEX is have an S&P 500 index fund derivative on crypto so that anybody with a smartphone could actually start investing, even if it's $5 or $10 or $100, and start building wealth uh, instead of just hiding it under their, you know, in their house somewhere or, or just spending it. Uh, that was the goal. Do you feel that this initial kind of vision continued with the company or did it change? Well, the funny thing is that um, we actually, uh, well, BitMEX, did launch an S&P 500 index fund derivative. Um, they also launched a, a, a Shanghai 50 A share derivative. They launched a couple of these products, and, and um, unfortunately, like we weren't well, it, nobody bought them, right? Because most of the people uh, in the world who were involved with crypto or could access crypto already had brokerage accounts, right? So the challenge is that well, I mean, we came up with the product, but there was no product market fit because we couldn't get the people who needed this product. We couldn't get it to them because. Yeah. It was 2016, and they didn't really have wallets. And not only did they not have wallets, they definitely did not have crypto wallets. So, um, so that's uh, that. Uh, so we shut all that down. Um, now I think there's probably more opportunity now. Um, but st you know, there, we have companies like Abra who are focused on you know providing crypto wallets to people in the Philippines and all over. Are so, you an investor in Abra? No, uh, no. Uh, I gave them an offer, but they already raised quite a lot of money. Uh, and um, but yeah, one of our one of our mentors, um, Wei Hopeman at Arbor Ventures, introduced me to Abra, and we had a couple chats. But um, yeah, they, they actually pivoted. Well, they didn't pivot, but they used to be really focused on emerging markets crypto for remittance, uh, and they figured out how to do it legally. I mean, they actually got licenses, uh, but now they're just uh, I think they're doing you know crypto everything like a wallet for everyone. Uh, I'm actually an Abra user, but I'm not an investor. Interesting. So were you like the first investor in BitMEX? Did he come to you when there was already a product, or was it still just like an idea that he had? Um, well, in terms of who was first, I could say I'm, I'm the first and only VC investor uh, in BitMEX. Uh, and um, they had already been live for nine months uh, when we invested. And they uh, were kind of focused on corporate clients. Because the idea, I guess, they had was that people were buying lawnmowers with crypto, or at least theoretically they might be. And they thought that these large corporations were taking in Bitcoin, and then they would want to hedge their positions. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there were some corporates taking Bitcoin uh, and selling products, but I think they mostly thought about it as like a marketing exercise. Uh, and nobody was hedging anything. So after nine months, they were doing two hundred fifty dollars a week in revenue. Uh, and you how know, much? Two hundred and two hundred fifty dollars okay. a week in revenue. Okay. That's it. Yeah, two hundred fifty after nine months of being live. Um, so I'm like, hey guys, you know, like do you, are you obviously don't have product market fit. I mean, it goes back to like you know, lean startup 101. You talk to your customers and they tell you to fuck off. Like you, you need to go back to the drawing board. Uh, and so what we did is like, okay, so who cares about this stuff? Who could care about this stuff? And we started running experiments, just like basic startup, doing interviews, um, and. Um, we made some assumptions that maybe consumers might want to do this. Uh, in Asia, people love currency trading. Uh, they've always loved currency trading. I knew this. And actually, uh, their ability to trade currency has been curtailed a little bit because the currency trading houses have been cutting off. Like, like before, you could do a million dollars account, and they would give you 70x leverage. So you're basically trading $70 million worth of currency. A lot of the houses that we're doing now, the, 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 the currency houses, were getting hosed. So they cut it down. Like, you can only put 250K in your account. They're limiting it. And you can only, we're only going to give you 20X leverage. That's it. Um, and because they were just, they were 
too exposed. And so people are like, well, I want my, I want to put more money in. I want to like risk more. And so um, basically what we helped BitMEX do is pivot to retail. And, um, you know, most markets start with retail. Uh, and then we help them with marketing. This is what we do. User acquisition, customer acquisition, sales in Asia. Uh, so the funniest thing is you can maybe still find them up there. But like Arthur, you know, in his apartment, uh, who is the CEO of BitMEX, uh, giving lessons and options uh, and YouTube videos. And we did a bunch of YouTube videos. Really? Do like, you have a story where you guys started in a one one bedroom apartment? No, he was in his apartment <laughs> okay, and he had like office. a t-shirt on. Uh, but no, I mean, he, they were working, Ben and Arthur were working out of our office. They they had the desk in our office in Shanghai at China Accelerator. So they started off in Shanghai with the Vivian. No, no, they started off in Hong, Hong Kong. Kong. Yeah. Um, they moved to Shanghai for three months oh. for China Accelerator Batch uh, 8, uh, lucky number 8, uh, in the fall of 2015. And they worked out of our office for three months. And in that three months, they went from $250 a week in revenue to $11,000 a week in revenue. Uh, and they were profitable because there's only three of them. Uh, and uh, by you know January that you know, and then they January that year, they were doing almost 100,000 a month. And this in, is in what revenue. year? This is 2015. 2015. By January 2016, they were doing 100k a month. They won uh, Tech in Asia number one startup in Hong Kong. Then they 2016 spring they won Tech in Asia number one startup in all of Asia. And uh, you know I was uh, on stage with them. They got a little ten thousand dollar check, um, but um, none of the VCs invested in them. So you know they're trying to raise two million dollars. No one would give them money, even though they're doing 100k a month in net revenue. Uh, no one would touch it. Uh, and I have, uh, I actually pushed it hard. I have messages to literally like 25, 30 VCs. Like, I got this thing called BitMEX. You should invest. And, you know, no one. And uh, as of, uh, you know, the Times of London, as of two and a half years ago, said that they were worth uh, $8 billion. Now, I have no idea how much they're worth now. You know, they have some legal issues that they're sorting through. But we'll see. So the 100x kind of leverage was... Your idea that started off in Shanghai, is that what made it kind of take off or was that like later on? Like how, what did it start? No, they offered with? leverage, um, but uh, what made it take off is that they focus on a different consumer Retail, and yeah. they solved that consumer's challenge. And that consumer's challenge is that they wanted to speculate. They want, and you know, I look at Bitcoin not as, I mean, Bitcoin gives many things to many people. Um, but in this case, um, it's the same as an orange juice future. I don't know. There's like a, this old movie, with Eddie Murphy, with like called Trading Places, where, you know, they get some guy, Eddie Murphy, and he's like trading stuff. And it, it's like, and, and the joke is that they were trading orange juice futures, right? Yeah. Um, it doesn't actually really matter what the hell you're trading, as long as there's volatility. Volatility is the product. Uh, so uh, Bitcoin has volatility. Therefore, it's attractive, right? And so, uh, you know, what, what really people want is volatility. Vol is almost everything, especially to short-term traders. Uh, so that's kind of what we were marketing out there with, um, you know, our YouTube videos and our, like, uh, messages. And uh, we did English and Chinese. And um, back in the day, China was, like, the number four market for BitMEX. When they started off in China, you were still it was still able and not and not illegal to trade Bitcoin and stuff. Well, here's the thing: um, it, uh, Bitcoin is not illegal in China. Transferring RMB to Bitcoin is illegal, or yeah. So crypto is not illegal, as far as I know. Um, so, do you often get asked about your your crazy BitMEX stories, or? <laughs> not really. I don't think most people don't really know that we invested in BitMEX. I mean, yeah, you're very oh, secret about it. No, we're not. It's on my profile for all my social. It's not so much secret. It's right. just that, um, it is on your only your profile. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not a secret. It's just that... Um, so I've done uh, about 40 uh, blockchain investments, um, but I don't go to a lot of events, and I don't um, talk about them so much. Um, I mean, I've got a lot of things to do, and so uh, I, you know, I, I go to maybe one a year. Uh, and uh, like so events in general, or, or no, 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 like blockchain events. Um, so the thing about our blockchain investments is that you know we're we most of them we're not in uh, fintech. Mm -hmm. They're like companies solving using blockchain to solve very traditional boring problems. 
right? So for me, blockchain is about transparency, security, and trust. And so there's a lot of like really boring problems that can be solved with blockchain. And so there's a lot, there was a lot of hype. There's a huge hype cycle. Then there was a dead cycle, you know, 2018. I was investing all the way through that in blockchain. But I mean, our company is the goal was actually to make revenue. Now, it wasn't sexy or exciting, and it wasn't really like there wasn't not that many parties. But I'll give you an example. Like, um, one of our LPs um, in our fund, uh, they make grain processing machinery. Right, so they like process. I don't know, like seventy percent of the world's corn flows through their giant machines. Like each one of these machines is one kilometer long. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so you know they, they do rice as well, and so they have this little camera in the machine, right? And the camera looks at the rice going through, and it basically they have an algorithm, you know, you know some sort of machine vision shit that uh, tells um, how many of the grains are broken. And the price of the rice is based on the number of broken grains. So if you have like nice long rice, okay, it's good, high price. A little tiny rice, you know, broken up, uh, lower price. So, you know, th- they have a challenge because some people are screwing around with the pictures so they can get a higher price for the rice. So we were like, hey, well, we can solve that. You can put the camera on a blockchain. And you can't stop them from screwing around with the pictures. But it, on a blockchain, you can tell if they screwed around with them. Okay. Yeah. That's an interesting, um, you know, kind of like cool thing uh, that you can use blockchain for. It's really boring. I mean, but like rice is a big industry. Corn's a big industry. Grain is like it's global food, right? And, um, you know, it's big business. Uh, so it, it might not be so exciting as like, I don't know, like you don't throw parties around grain processing measurement. Um, <laughs> you could. <laughs> I guess, but like I'd never been to one of those. I would go. Um, but uh, that's kind of the things that we were focused on. I have a friend that did um, agriculture, like agriculture, but could her models because he wanted to combine both. But you, yeah. I'll connect you guys. Okay, um, awesome. So how is it that you're so kind of rounded in all these different, you know, industries and startups. How does that, how do you, how does that work? We could do a whole series just on you speaking about, you know, different, these different sectors. How does that, how are you to do that? How are you able to do that? Well, um, it's, uh, I'm old, relatively. Like I've been doing, like, uh, doing tech investment 25 years. Okay. And the thing about tech investment is tech used to be like a sector. And then slowly tech became everything. Right, so tech touches everything. Um, so if you do tech for 25 years, you each year you learn about a new thing, uh, and over time you get to understand more and more about more different things. I mean, um, I mean now we have like something called DeFi, and like I didn't know what the hell DeFi is like decentralized finance. I'm like, okay, so that means that there's centralized finance, and I basically found out everything I've been investing in is centralized finance, and then there's now there's decentralized finance. I'm like, cool. So um, what can we do with this? And then it's like, oh, wow. So we don't have to go to traditional banks anymore um, to get funding. And so we're invested in Boost Capital, and they are a SaaS platform that does basically microloans, uh, software for microloans. But they actually, they, they usually partner with banks and, and local financial institutions. So they launched in Cambodia. Uh, and their like default rate is extremely low. It's like less than two percent because micro loans generally the, the generally have a, a low default rate. But they don't have capital, right? Like they have like more people applying for loans than they have capital. Um, so you can take sort of decentralized finance, and that you know you can basically do like a, a crowdfunding campaign, or you can you know and, and, and pull finance in, and then so it's DeFi to centralized finance because Boost is actually centralized. But the other thing is that, you know, what we're talking to Boost about is like, well, once you get big enough volume, um, you can actually decentralize your platform. I mean, you can basically open up the loans uh, to everybody uh, and just make them available. And then people can decide whether they want to fund them or not. Um, I think right now they're paying about like 12% annual, uh, super low default rate, but also is having a really big impact. Because their customers in Cambodia are, I mean, they're individuals, but they're all like small business people who, without 
this type of loan could not actually get a loan uh, and can't grow their business. And, and you know, Cambodia is a tough place um, to, uh, you know, to get loans for small, medium businesses or for individuals. Interesting. I'm just wondering, I'm always really curious when I see startups from like Mongolia, Cambodia, Myanmar. Do you also have um, mentors in these areas or, or access to these sort of um, areas or countries? I mean, um, so our fund is backed by IFC World Bank. Um, at least the last fund was. We're not wholly focused on emerging markets, so um, so uh, they didn't come in in the first one. But we're also partnered with Asian Development Bank, uh, and they ran a fintech platform, uh, actually accelerator platform for kind of Laos, Cambodia, and um, the markets there. Uh, so I would say yes, we have mentors, but like they're usually at least for these markets, there are foreigners who went in and spent a lot of time there. Um, on the local side, not as much. Um, we, uh, you know, always look for more mentors. Um, but um, I think the the idea for a lot of these companies is that they're solving, like this boost capital, they're solving a problem that uh, is uh, in many, many markets, right? Uh, but it's especially tough in some of these kind of outlier markets that people don't really understand very much, like Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar. So yes, we are active in Myanmar. We're, we invested in a game platform. Uh, and a lot of our users are in Myanmar, and we're partnered with the local telcos there. So you must have seen a lot of these entrepreneurs or um, startups through your years. Uh, some advice, or what do you look for? How do you know? What are the qualities that it, it takes to have a good startup? Well, it's uh, it's a little tough. So, um, so we we I mean, early stage is very difficult. So we generally invest in in, in entrepreneurs. That um, are they don't give up, right? And and so people in the valley four or five years ago, you know, coined the term like cockroach. Uh, so we invest in cockroach entrepreneurs. We invest in entrepreneurs that you know you can step on them, and they might lose a leg or two, but they get up and keep on going, right? So the the challenge with starting up is it's very very difficult. It's very hard, uh, and you know, people who do startups are crazy. Like definitionally, so no salary, burn up all your savings, you know, alienate all your friends because you don't talk to them, alienate your spouse or partner because you don't see them, um, and then you're doing something that's never been done before, and then your life is basically characterized by failure after failure after failure after failure. That's not definitionally like sane. Um, so we are investing in, in crazy people, and they have to be a little bit nuts in order to fail, 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 fail. And our role, uh, we're in best, we accelerate, is to help them fail faster and help them fail a little bit more uh, smarter. Um, we try very, very hard not to tell the, our, the entrepreneurs that we work with what to do um, because we don't know. I mean, I started investing in crypto in 2015. I didn't know what the hell it was. I just I invest first and ask questions later. So we we go in with um, you know a long list of assumptions, and then we actually experiment and we test those assumptions. And we go out and we ask questions. We do A/B tests. We do experiments, and then the data will tell us what to do. Uh, and this is a process that we run with our entrepreneurs. Um, but it's super painful because. Every time you run one of those experiments, and we try and get the, the teams to do like one, two, three, four experiments a week, well, most of them all fail. But sometimes, you know, the, they click. Um, and we're getting pretty good at helping our companies uh, run these experiments. And so the experiments are starting to click faster. That's cool. I'm just wondering, because when I hear Accelerator, I often think early stage. Do you stay with the company for like later stages, do you sort of exit when they get VC money, or how does that work? Yeah, so um, the way I would think about Accelerator um, is that uh, we try and eat our own dog food, if you ever heard that expression. So eating your own dog food is also like practice what you preach. So I can talk about accelerating and data and experiments all day long, but like actually we do the same thing ourselves. So we measure everything that we do. And, you know, Oscar's mantra is like, if we're not changing 20% of what we do every year, you know, we're not improving. Uh, and so, you know, we can't be doing everything right. We always need to be changing. So we've taken that accelerator model and kind of flipped it around. So accelerators, by definition, are time-based. Our program never ends. 
Like we continue to support forever. Um, and so I'd say um, we do still have demo days, um, but we don't have batches anymore. At least for Mox, there's no batches, it's rolling. Uh, for China Accelerator, it's also rolling, but we have a little bit more of a structure because it's focused on uh, enterprise and China market entry. So it's like six months and then support. Uh, but, uh, you know, right now the entire, and the other thing is like China Accelerator and Mox used to be two programs. Now it's one platform. So any company that works with us, if they need resources from, you know, BD for large corporate for promotion or sales into enterprise or, you know, the growth team is one growth team, it's all one platform. So we keep on changing uh, everything that we do, um, and that's allowed us to improve. Um, and the companies that we get are, you know, the big change over the last year is that the companies that we're getting, they're willing to take our capital. I mean, we need at least 5% of the company, and we invest max like 180K, and we keep 45,000 of it, right? So it's 150K, 180K, um, but the actual cash is 105, you know, uh, or like 135. It's not actually that much money. Um, and so, you know, it's just one of our companies in the current batch, they're doing 250K monthly net revenue. <laughs> they're doing a 250K monthly net revenue pre-program. So on 100 times monthly net revenue, like a standard US valuation, that's a $25 million pre, right? And actually we're helping them raise at a $35 million pre, but like they're still growing. Um, but that is not like a, you would say like a normal type accelerator, um, which is why we're not actually saying that we're so much of an accelerator anymore. I mean, we're a VC that delivers value through our accelerator programs. And what company, what startup was this? It's called AMA. AMA. Yeah. It's uh, basically a top five world leading pregnancy uh, tracker and app. So they have um, pre-pregnancy, pregnancy app, and then post-pregnancy, early childhood. Uh, it's all about health. Um, they have 1.5 million active pregnant families or women on the app, like right now, which is basically like 5% of the pregnant women in the freaking world. Um, and if you go to the U.S., the average amount of money spent during a pregnancy is 16000 U.S. dollars. Um, there's a huge opportunity around this, and we're helping them expand from Europe to Asia. And that's why they're willing to work with us, because we can help with customer acquisition, user acquisition, and market entry. I feel like when I think of Mox, all I see is you. You've mentioned Oscar, but I feel like all of the things that you're doing is, you know, 100 people behind you or something like that. So can you elaborate on your team and who else is kind of helping helping with Mox grow? Yeah. So the single most important thing about, you know, what we do at SOSV is we are not in the MBA. There's no courses. We're mentor driven. So every single company's uh, experience is unique. And we're not like a puppy farm. We're not doing like 250 companies a batch. You know, we're not like churn and burning, right? So um, every, every uh, you know, it's all one-on-one. -on -one. It's all bespoke and it's module based. So I like to talk about it as sort of like a, like a, it's not a buffet where you just show up and you can eat everything. Uh, it's also not where you get four mentors assigned with you and then they just mentor you like one-on-one -on -one every week in and week out. Um, it's a little bit like a sushi boat restaurant where we have lots of different things to eat and it's on a little train and it comes around. So you always know that there's another module coming around and you take what you need when you need it. And then we work together, you know, for six months, weekly meetings and then biweekly or monthly meetings after that. And, and then we figure out, okay, you know, how's it going? What's your plan? Can we help you with experiments? And then, um, you know, like, how can we help? So um, uh, our, our platform is divided into different areas. Um, so first is growth, like growth hacking, like using data to help drive business. And that's led by TR. Uh, so TR, all of, uh, basically every single person who works in, 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 uh, on our platform used to be a mentor. Like I used to be a mentor. I started off 11 years ago as a mentor at China Accelerator, uh, and I joined as a MD um, you know, and a general partner at SOSV six and a half years ago. So Oscar uh, also joined 10 years ago as a mentor, and he joined as MD China Accelerator uh, and a partner at SOSV, um, Jesus, uh, four, four and a half years ago. 
right? So that's Oscar and I. And then growth is TR. So TR and I go way back. Um, he built up, uh, he's like nine years in China, now he's in LA. Uh, so he built up uh, his uh, basically performance marketing uh, business, zero to 70 people, and then exited to Asia Stensu Network. Um, so he's all about data and all about growth. And he leads a team of uh, five people or four people, including him. Five people, including him. Uh, the second thing, we have a team around BD sales, so enterprise sales. Uh, that's led by Jenny. Jenny is based here in Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, and so she's got a team uh, that focuses on, um, on selling to large corporates um, so, and partnerships. Uh, then we have our corporate innovation, which is basically connecting large corporates with startups for paid pilots. That's led by Eric. You know, local Chinese, uh, Michigan MBA, kind of like uh, worked in companies like GE before and Capgemini. So he's more like a corporate sales guy and he can help penetrate China. Mm -hmm. um, this is a long answer, but we have a yeah. lot of groups. So we have comms and PR. Okay, that, so you yeah, do yeah. have so them. It's not like, just like teams. Bell Bean running around town. No, no, no. My job is to run around town. <laughs> I, I do that a lot. Um, yeah, no, because <laughs> that's my job. Yeah, um, my job is to, uh, my job, I lead investment. Um, so I help the companies defend themselves against asshole VCs. Um, I help the company. So if they do have another VC coming in, you're the one that sort of makes sure that everything is, is smoothly. In so there. we take common shares. So when the founder gets fucked, we get fucked, right? Uh, so we're in the same boat and we're usually quite early. So we're kind of like the early stage people oftentimes um, get pushed down by the late stage people. Uh, it's common practice from the most famous VCs in the world uh, to to basically, you know, push down the founders and also to, and especially if the you know founder leaves, God forbid, then then, then they're out, they it's crammed down. Uh, but the early stage investors, I mean, our job is to help the the companies and then make sure that their rights are protected uh, as they raise more and more money. Uh, and in fact, with Mox and China Accelerator, I mean, our role is to do user acquisition for free and sales for free. So if we do our jobs, you're not going to have to raise money. You're not going to have to take that dilution um, because we're ROI positive, customer acquisition, user acquisition. Um, and the great thing about you know, our, our platform, uh, both platforms, is on the enterprise side, on the consumer side, if we do our jobs correctly, never have to raise again. You know, so for BitMEX, the founders still own over 90% of the company. The founders still own 90% of the company. Over, yeah. Our, our, I mean, yeah. We're the only VC, and we generally take around 6%. Go profitable. No dilution. Much better. That's why you get three founders who are individual billionaires. And, and, and an accelerator who could potentially be the fourth. No, <laughs> no um, our LPs are going to be very happy, though. And uh, Sean is uh, our founder. Um, I mean... Sean O'Sullivan is an amazing guy, um, but the only reason why we can do all these crazy things is because we're not taking money from traditional LPs, at least in the past. Um, fund three, uh, where BitMEX went through, it's a $150 million fund, and uh, Sean put up $100 million of it. Oh, so these are just individual LPs? They're not no, this is uh, our managing general partner, Sean O'Sullivan, uh, and he... He, our GP commit was 66%. So the $150 million fund, um, you know, 2015, 16, 17, 18, he put up $100 million of it himself. Wow. So, so branding-wise, do you think that, you know, is it Mox that you want, or do you want Mox as, like, the silent partner to building up strong brands? Where, are you, where do you like to be placed? Um, sorry. So, I mean, I mean we, we brand for ourselves. We brand as SOSV. Um, and then Mox is basically for, focused on consumer. I mean, you know, it's internet, but all internet is kind of mobile these days. So Mox is mobile. And then China Accelerator, um, you know, it's a, it's a, we're number one in Asia, right? We're the first accelerator in Asia, first in China, uh, first and only active accelerator in Asia to have a unicorn to go through the program. Uh, and China is an increasingly difficult place to enter. Um, you know, decoupling is real. Um, it's very hard uh, for global companies to get in. Um, but it's still the number two economy, soon to be the number one economy. So you cannot ignore China. 
And so, you know, China Accelerator actually uh, has more and more of a role to play. I mean, we helped advise, just advice, they didn't go through the program, you know, companies like Evernote and LinkedIn and uh, Airbnb when they came into China. Um, actually, no, that's not true. Uh, Airbnb, Evernote, and uh, not so much LinkedIn. But um, the LinkedIn, and you know, they, they created a decent model for China market entry. Uh, and so, but it's hard. I mean, we've got internet bubbles, right? So uh, before it was like China's internet bubble. It's actually, in, it's an intranet, not an internet. Mm -hmm. It's like separate. Mm -hmm. And then you had kind of like rest of the world. And then, then Europe created their own internet bubble with GDPR. And it kind of, you know, sort of spread from there. And then India created their own internet bubble when they kicked the Chinese out. And then US is in danger of creating their internet bubble. We'll see what happens with Biden. But Trump was going to create a separate internet for the US. So we've got... Um, you know, globalization is like somehow a dirty word, but tech is global. Uh, and it just becomes dip more difficult to do cross-border business. And we focus on cross-border internet and software. So we're helping people go cross those borders. Do you feel that COVID has um, affected all of, all of your internet companies or what's going to be after COVID? Is there, how's that affecting it? Yeah, so Mox is kind of unique. Um, yeah, yeah, well, almost unique. So we give free advertising to our users. We give free user acquisition to our users. So the problem with consumer internet is that the unit economics have busted. Um, now you can blame it on Google and Facebook. You know, probably in, in large part it's their fault. Um, but basically, the amount of money that you pay for a user, your customer acquisition cost could be a dollar. And your lifetime value, especially when you're an early stage uh, company, is usually not a dollar. It might be like 20 cents. So most VCs can do math. And they're like, wow, I'm spending a dollar to make 20 cents. I'm not investing. So the interest from venture capital in consumer internet is basically zero, unless you're somebody like SoftBank who's like, OK, I'm going to drop $100 million. And we're just going to burn it on Google and Facebook ads. And you're just going to get a lot of users. Um, that model kind of like got pushed back a little bit, um, you know, a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, um, after the WeWork issue and the Uber issue. Uh, so using money as a weapon is less um, um, attractive uh, uh, strategy than it used to be, uh, because there was a couple, you know, those spectacular failures. Um, but uh, so what we do at Moxo is free user acquisition. So um, you instead of spending a dollar, you spend zero. And then you make that 20 cents, and then you share seven cents of it back to whoever gave you that user. Um, so we, for Mox, partner with everybody who's getting trashed by big internet. Uh, and we go knock on their doors, and we say, hey, will you advertise our products for free? We'll give you an internet business model. We're like super app in a box. So you have users, you have trust, and we have a lot of services. And if you promote some or one or more of our services, we'll give you revenue share back. Uh, so we go to banks, we went to telcos, we went to TV stations, radio stations, everybody who's getting killed by big internet, even shopping malls, retail brands, like, um, in fact, like, like sneaker brands and jeans brands and clothes brands and beer brands, they all hate big internet because big internet is trying to cut them off from their own customers and create a paywall. So the brand has to pay to get to their own customers. And so what we do is we're breaking that down. Um, so we partner with the brands, and they promote us to free to their customers. And then we rev share back. Uh, and so first three and a half years, everybody to go, told me to go jump in a lake, like get lost. Like I'm not, you know, People pay me for advertising. Why would I give it to you for free? But they kind of started to wake up. So the first three and a half years took us three and a half years on 15 apps to get 6 million monthly active users, which is pretty crap. Uh, but since mid-2018 to uh, August 2009, uh, no, to mid-2019 to August 2020, um, we went to 50 million MAU, monthly active users, uh, with a customer acquisition cost of zero. And between August of last year to this February, when we did the last count before our demo day 10 uh, for Mox, we, um, we're now at 102 million monthly active users. And that's all with a customer acquisition cost of zero. So our five-year goal is to have a billion monthly active users. 
And with that, we would be, you know, hopefully top 10 or at least top 15 uh, internet thing. So we're not a platform, we're not a company, we're not a super app, we're an ecosystem. Um, we're also hopefully resilient uh, in that it's decentralized. All these companies are working together based on trust. Uh, and so far, it's, uh, it's working. We're pre-installed in 44% of the smartphones in India right now. Cool, very cool. Yeah, it's crazy. It's actually working. And it's unique because no other VC in the world has thought about doing this. Except for maybe Xiaomi. But, <laughs> uh, we're partnering with Xiaomi, so Xiaomi is great. Yeah, we're pre-installed in every Xiaomi in India. Oh, wow. Is that going to be kind of like what you're working towards your biggest market right now is, is focused on India? Uh, yeah, number one is India, number two is uh, Indonesia, number three for Mox is China, number four is South Korea. We're pre-installed in every Samsung in South Korea. Yeah, it's kind of cool. And now we have two apps. So this model is amazing because like, we did a test on our first e-commerce app in, in, uh, in the Samsungs in South Korea, and we sold 12,000 cups of coffee in one day. I mean, it's a lot of users, right? Uh, and then they're like, cool. So... We, we basically came up with a coffee app. We partnered with like the number two local coffee chain called 10,000 Lab. And now they have a coffee app in Samsung. Basically pop Starbucks out, right? So Starbucks has 400 venues, uh, stores, and uh, 10,000 Lab, I think, has like 240. So now the app's there. And now Samsung takes revenue share on every cup of coffee. But 10,000 Lab doesn't have to pay marketing. So yeah, I think uh, you guys have been based in Taipei for a long time, but no one really kind of understands what you guys are doing or the value there. So that's why I'm happy that you came today and, and talked a bit about, you know, the whole entire ecosystem. So yeah, if you have, what else are you kind of um, excited about either Taiwan or personally that you want to share with everyone? Yeah, so I think um, one of the best things that's ever happened to Taiwan, and it sounds kind of weird, is COVID. That's uh, really weird. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people, I mean... COVID is like horrible. Like um, people I've known died, and then uh, I just went back to the U.S. for seven weeks. And my goal was not to get sick, right? And I'm going to go back again in June and get uh, vaccinated. Uh, but um, you know, like it's very difficult for my family. Didn't go out for like a year now, and they're now vaccinated. And they're like uh, that three week thing past the second vaccination, and they're just about to hit it. So they're like, woohoo! Uh, but they, you still have to be super careful, even if you're vaccinated, right? So. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, you know Taiwan is, is great for is you know I was here in 2003 during SARS, been there, done that, and like people normally wear masks like when they're sick here, just because they're courteous to other people, um, and so it's um, it's a it's a culture that's really you know helped uh, the island do very very well through this tough time. Um, so there really hasn't been COVID here. And so it's become very attractive um, to a lot of leaders from around the world who are like, okay, well, I'll go you know, connect um, in Taiwan for something other than just visiting family and eating food and go, coming out for Lunar New Year, right? Um, so we have like, uh, you know, you know, Kevin, who's co-founder of Twitch, is here, and Steve, the co-founder of YouTube, is now here. Uh, they came even, um, Steve came before uh, the pandemic, but Susan, who started Elevate Taiwan, and they're, they're coming back, and like, as they live here, they're like, oh, wow, this is a great place. And so they're, because they're, you know, Silicon Valley style, they want to give back. Um, and I think that, um, you know, Taiwan is going to be um, an actual player uh, going forward. I mean, there's probably... The, on the internet side, you know, so far behind every single other market in Asia. Uh, but uh, I think, um, you know, we were the first international VC to come to Taiwan that the government did not.